You know how I lean on things? Because my fucking back hurts all the time. From the global headquarters of the Asgard Company in beautiful downtown Wichita Falls, Texas. From the finest mind in the modern fitness industry. The one true voice of the strength and conditioning profession. The most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, Starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. Thank you, Mark Wolf, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, we are here in the beautiful, expansive, highly decorative, garishly opulent studios of uh, the Asgard Company here in beautiful downtown Wichita Falls. And... uh, in fact, we're just right across the street from Wichita Falls Athletic Club, the greatest gym in the world. And uh, and we have, uh, in fact, Garm is over there right now. I'm going to figure out a way to get our Garm dog on the on the podcast one of these days. See, if we had him in here running around, he could jump up here and he'd, he'd be sitting there looking around for five, six seconds, and then he'd get bored and go somewhere else. I think we ought to try to have him in sometime. He would do that. He'd knock over everything in here because he just doesn't understand some things. But he's he's a good boy, though. He's a very good boy. So anyway, what are we going to talk? We're going to talk today about back pain. And uh, uh, but first, I want to talk about a couple of pertinent topics here. Seminar schedule. Let's go over that real quick. We. Uh, by the time this airs, we'll already have uh, been done with the June 7th through 9th seminar in Wichita Falls. We're in July, the 26th, 28th. We're in Woodmere, New York, on Long Island at uh, Enoch Copples. Wonderful little gym up there. Uh, we like going up there to visit Ena primarily because the pizza is good. <clears throat> and... Uh, Sometimes she brings her dogs in. She brings Elliot and uh, Iggy. Iggy Dog, the Igosaurus, little Italian greyhound, little eight-pound creature about like this, who's a bug eyes. just bug eyes, evil, jumps up in the air, steals food out of your hands and stuff. You know why he does that? Because he hadn't been killed yet. That's why. But I think we're going to kill him when we're up there. <clears throat> Just plan the event, kill Iggy. And then Roland Dog, who walks around on his hind legs, he's kind of a funny little creature. All four, all three of those little dogs she's got are just like interesting little animals, right? So that's one of the reasons we like to go up there. And then we will be in Los Angeles in August. August 16th to 18th in Los Angeles. I've got to go. I'll be in Los Angeles. I know. Shut up. I don't want to hear about it. Uh, I'm not going to Orange County, I don't think. Well, Gulf Shrimp, you know, might get me to go. I don't know. Artillery would be more likely to be the hook. Uh, that's uh, 16th, 18th, August. And then we're, this will be a good trip, Boston. We'll be in Boston September 27th through 29th. And uh, that's always an interesting place to go. That part of that part of the year ought to be nice and colorful up there. Leaves changing up there in September. Pretty trip. Food in Boston's good. Place called the Public House, I remember in Cambridge, but still there. We'll have to go there. That was an interesting Sunday night place to go. So all that's coming up, and uh, if you've not been to a seminar, you need to make your plans. We're uh, uh, always proud to bring our educational products to you, and uh, this will be an opportunity for you to save uh, some uh, mileage if you're up in the Northeast, up in Boston. Now, Stan Everding is... uh, uh, saying nice things about our pressing technique online. And uh, uh, we just want to make you guys aware of the fact that Efforting's food company, uh, 
the vertical diet people, uh, sell an excellent product. It ships on Monday or Tuesday of the week. It consists of uh, pre-prepared meals that are frozen. Uh, they ship in styrofoam containers, hour or 20 at a time. And they end up being about 10 or 11 bucks a piece. And they're excellent. And if you don't have time to, to leave to eat, you warm them up in the microwave. They're fabulous. Beef, rice, potatoes, just good staple stuff. We've got a uh, rather large menu. We've got some breakfast items. got some fermented oatmeal for breakfast, which is good. It's better than you think it'd be. Excellent stuff. So uh, uh, since, uh, since Stan is being nice to us, I want you guys to do business with him. Uh, just look him up online. It's, it's called The Vertical Diet. Look up Stan Efforting online, and you'll have the, see a link to the to the order page and uh, go do business with Stan. Good man. Uh, we just got back from uh, this past weekend. Uh, of course, there'll be a delay since we're taping today. We just got back a couple of days ago from the grand opening of Starting Strength Austin. And uh, the place looks good. The place looks great. It's a, it's a nice big facility. You, you, you'd be deceived about the fact that it's only 1600 square feet there's plenty of room the trade dress looks excellent the arts on the walls our trademark furniture is in the lobby all of our equipment is set up the whole thing is just it just turned out way better than i thought it would it's just a, an excellent little gym and uh, uh it's there on west anderson lane in north Austin, and uh, those of you that are in the area need to swing by and check it out. Uh, there is uh, continued activity, continued inquiries about other people buying these franchises. Uh, the list of gyms is up on the website at startingstrengthgyms.com. And uh, startingstrengthgyms.com is the list with the expected opening dates. Uh, nine gyms are in the works right now, and uh, you'll need to uh, make your plans if you live in one of these cities. Houston, Austin, Dallas, Denver, Boston are all accounted for right now. And uh, we've had inquiries from New York, several other places around the country, Chicago, for example. And you know, continuing the the process of getting these things up and running. So those of you who are interested, check out the website at startingstrengthgyms.com. Now, let's get to today's topic, back pain, okay? Back pain is uh, one of these things that we hear about all the time. We hear about uh, We hear about back pain on the website. People ask us about it. Uh, every day there are inquiries about what to do about back pain on the website. Is it okay to deadlift and squat with back pain? Uh, so forth and so on. All right. Bottom line. All humans have back pain. There are no exceptions. If you are 50, you've had back pain. It may or may not have been associated with anything you were doing. You just had back pain. One morning you woke up and your back hurts. Uh, this is just, you know, look, join the club. This is the common human experience. Humans have back pain. The reason humans have back pain is rather interesting. It's because of the structure of the back. The human back is an interesting column, a vertical, more or less, column of bones that are separated by fibrocartilaginous discs, the intervertebral discs. And those discs separate the bones and allow for wiggly movement to take place. They allow you to perform a sit-up in back flexion. They allow you to perform 
uh, movement in back extension. They allow for some side-to-side movement. But the problem is your vertical back, your bipedal back, was not designed originally for this function that we took it upon ourselves to give it several million years ago, uh, up to, well, prior to four million years ago, uh, this particular branch of the primate family tree was not bipedal. We were not, we were not upright all day like we are now. Several things changed when we decided to stand up and walk around. Uh, our knee and hip geometry changed quite a bit. Uh, the geometry of the foot uh, went through an extreme period of modification. And uh, our feet are unlike those of any of the primates. As a result of uh, this bipedalism adaptation we undertook. But in addition to all of that stuff, all of the stuff above the pelvis also changed. The human back is in an upright position loaded in compression. But our ancestral spine was a quadrupedal spine, and it was supported front and back by our forelegs and hind legs, and the primary function of the intervertebral discs was not load-bearing. It was not uh, a compressively loaded system as it is in an upright creature. It was uh, essentially loaded in moment, and the moment force it was loaded with was that of its own uh, load suspended from below the spine, the gut load that was on the back was the only load the, the spine was, was in. The intervertebral discs in this configuration presented themselves as separators of the vertebral bodies, and they uh, facilitated flexion laterally from side to side. Like when your dog licks his butt, okay? Like when your horse reaches around and tries to bite a fly who's chewing on his ass. This lateral flexion side to side that uh, a quadrupedal spine presents was the only thing that the intervertebral discs had to do. They weren't constantly loaded all day long in compression. Ours are. Now, as a result of this change in function several million years ago, our spines have taken on a new role. And it is a role for which they're not designed very well. Uh, As a result of that, I've seen estimates that everyone over the age of 35, and certainly every human being on earth over the age of 40, has what could be described as degenerative changes in the spine. This involves bony overgrowth, spurring, osteophytes, this sort of thing, thinning of the intervertebral discs. Some herniations of the intervertebral discs are usually unavoidable and are not really a terrible problem unless they go the wrong direction and mash on the central canal and the spinal cord, uh, producing neurological problems. The vast majority of back injuries and back pain are local back pain. They are not associated with radiculopathy down the legs. They're not associated with loss of, of function uh, that a, a true profound neurological deficit would cause. Uh, if your uh, intervertebral discs herniate, uh, they could herniate in the wrong direction and press on the spine and cause problems not only down the legs but with uh, Uh, with functions associated with where those nerves come out of the spinal column and could be associated with gastric problems and 
numbness in the abdomen, lower abdomen, loss of, of control of the urinary functions, bladder functions, doo-doo functions, this sort of thing. These kind of abdominal problems are real severe, right? But they are a tiny minority of the types of back problems that most humans encounter as a normal course of their existence. Once again, everybody north of 35 or 40 has diagnosable degenerative spinal changes. In other words, if you go to the doctor for some bizarre reason, you're not symptomatic. You don't have any back pain. You don't have anything wrong at all. You go to the doctor, and you just want to see what your back looks like, and you somehow talk him into ordering a lumbar MRI, a thoracic MRI. You are going to present with degenerative changes in your spine. There will be a thin disc. There will be some spurring. There will be other changes that are diagnosable to an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in backs, or a neurosurgeon that indicate that your spine is older. It is normal for a spine to degenerate with age. And by normal, I don't mean it's good. I just mean that that's what happens to everybody. Now, remember, you have gone to the doctor without any symptoms. Your back doesn't hurt. Okay? Without any symptoms, without any back pain, you wouldn't have really a reason to go to the doctor. Nonetheless, you would present upon study with degenerative changes. Now, let's say you go to the doctor and you do have back pain. Guess what happens? You present with degenerative spinal changes, just like the guy who was asymptomatic did. Now, this presents... A serious problem, doesn't it? If everybody that goes to the doctor shows degenerative changes in the spine, then people with back pain are going to show degenerative changes in the spine. But people without pain are also going to show degenerative changes in the spine. And what this means is, now think with me very carefully here. If you go to the doctor and you've got degenerative changes in your spine and he MRIs you and he shows you these degenerative changes in the spine that are also present in somebody without back pain, this may very well mean that the degenerative changes that he shows you are not the cause of your symptoms because just as many people without symptoms have the same signs upon MRI diagnosis. And this presents an interesting situation, doesn't it? Um, I remember a long time ago, back when I was in the horse business, there was a, uh, a famous study done at, uh, I believe, and don't count me, you know, hold me to this. I'm terribly bad about remembering the picky specific details of just virtually everything. But uh, the study was done, I believe, at Georgia A&M, and they x-rayed the feet of about a 1,000 horses. They did uh, navicular disease studies on a 1,000 horses. And navicular disease is, in a horse is... Uh, the same level of problem that back pain is in humans. Uh, lots and lots of horses are lame. Lots and lots of horses uh, are so lame that they have to be put down. Now, fortunately, we don't put people down for having back pain, although it's not a bad idea. And it's something that, you know, we probably need to have that conversation, to quote Kamala Harris. And, uh, the, the studies that were done on, on horses at the time were very interesting. They just took a plain film x-ray of the horse's feet. I think it was front foot. Front feet are the most common sites of lameness in horses. And uh, navicular disease is, uh, if you're familiar with the 
the horse's distal appendage. Uh, the horse basically walks on his middle finger, and the coffin bone, which is the final digit that he's standing on, is the same bone in him as this middle, this last distal phalanx is here in you. And the column of bones goes up to his fetlock, but he's standing on the coffin bone. And the navicular bone is the one that articulates with the coffin bone. And if there are bony changes in that joint, it is thought that that predisposes the horse to lameness. If he injures that, if he fractures it, it can be very bad. And a lame horse is not much good to anybody, not even to himself, because if he can't get around, he can't graze, he can't be useful. So we typically don't indulge ourselves in the luxury of lame horses, and they go away. Now, the interesting part about this study was, is it had been theorized for, for many years that positive x-ray for navicular disease was not necessarily an indication of the presence of the conditions that predispose to lameness. So this study undertook to x-ray a whole bunch of horses' feet, and the interesting thing was that when they got through x-raying the feet of a thousand horses or so, they, uh, they found that there was no correlation between a positive diagnosis of navicular disease on x-ray and symptoms of lameness. A horse with symptoms of lameness was just as likely to x-ray positive for navicular disease as he was to x-ray negative for navicular disease. And a horse without lameness was just as likely to x-ray positive or negative for navicular disease. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Just because there are bony changes in a joint does not necessarily mean that the bony changes present a problem for the animal possessing the changes. And humans are the same exact way. If you go in with back pain and you go to the chiropractor and the chiropractor takes a plain film x-ray, it says, boy, this is L4, L5 sure does look like a mess. And you say to your chiropractor, well, would you please order me an MRI and let's look at this further. And in the states where a chiropractor can, in fact, order an MRI, and there are some states where you can do that, he sends you in for the MRI. And the MRI study shows that, in fact, you have profound degenerative changes at L4, L5. What I'm telling you is that the, the degenerative changes that you see on that study at L4, L5 may not represent the cause of the back pain because they're right next door to you. There's another guy with the same profound changes at L4, L5 that is fine, that does not have any back pain at all. And this is just, I know this is weird, but think about the problem here, okay? You've got chronic back pain. You show up with degenerative changes at L4, L5. Guy says, man, looks like you need back surgery. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't need back surgery. Maybe you don't want back surgery. Maybe what you want are deadlifts and squats. Because it has been our experience that for chronic back pain, the vast majority of the time, a guy with chronic back pain comes in the gym, listens to his buddies that have experienced this phenomenon. He comes in the gym, he deadlifts and he squats, and we show him how to do it correctly and all the mechanics are correct and he loads his back. Even though it hurts, he loads his back. And he does this 
for three weeks, nine workouts, and his back pain goes away. We see it all the time. You see, uh, how many? I had you looked that up. How many cases of this did you did you find? 24, 25, 26 cases of people on our board that have reported that they started training with weights and their back pain went away. And I can tell you that there are thousands and thousands of people across the country that have had this same experience. Now, here's the other side of this coin. All right. Say you have back surgery. Say the neurosurgeon talks you into a back surgery because you've got degenerative changes and your L4, L5 just looks like a nightmare. And we've got to go in there and clean this up. Back surgery is an interesting thing, okay? Back surgery, the results of back surgery are divided into roughly thirds, all right? One third of the time, back surgery is successful, meaning that it relieves the symptoms for which the surgery was performed, okay? One-third of the time, it does not relieve the symptoms for which it was performed, and one-third of the time, it makes the back pain worse. In other words, two-thirds of the time, back surgery is not successful. Now, I'm talking about back surgery. I'm not talking about a cervical uh, spinal surgery. I've had a fusion at C6, C7 myself back in 1999, 20 years ago, and I've been fine ever since. I woke up <clears throat> completely out of the very, very, very bad pain that I was in before they anesthetized me that morning at 6.30. I woke up and I was out of pain. My arm, the first thing I did, I remember very clearly, I looked down at my left arm and I said, the pain's gone. And then I went back to sleep <clears throat> there in the recovery room. Uh, so I had a, good, had a good outcome from that. But I know lots and lots of people who have not had a good outcome from lumbar spinal surgery. The cervical spine is not under near the load that the low back is. And it is not uh, as structurally a precarious a situation as is your lumbar spine. You go in there and start monkeying around with the lumbar spine, taking things out, putting things in. Things may not turn out the way you want them to turn out. Often they don't. More often than not, they don't. And there will be uh, people respond to this with, hey, my back surgery went just fine. And to that, I would say, good, I'm happy for you. But lots of people's it doesn't, right? You have to be very careful about back surgery. A uh, friend of mine over here at, uh, at the gym, uh, older guy, had some central canal stenosis cleared out. Uh, didn't really alter anything structurally about uh, about disc morphology or, or replace a, a disc or, you know, hardware, fusion, nothing like that. Just had some central, central stenosis cleared out, and he was fine. Back squatting in two weeks. I wouldn't hesitate to have that done myself, and, and I probably, I have some symptoms of some central canal stenosis myself, and I probably w will eventually end up having had that done. Uh but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having them go in and, and replace the disc with some kind of hardware and various other things they use to remedy these perceived degenerative changes in the low back. If you could stand it, don't, don't do that. All right. It's, it's, if you can stand it and I understand that there are times when your back hurts so fucking bad that you don't care. You got to try something and you let them cut on you. I understand that completely. I understand how the pain I was in before I had my, my neck fixed, and I understand that you may well be motivated to just try something. But let me point out that if, uh, if you have that done and it doesn't work, 
that you may be in a seriously uh, bad situation that, I mean, I know <laughs> there have been people that have killed themselves because of this kind of chronic pain because you just can't stand it anymore. I understand it. Just be aware of the fact that degenerative changes in the spine are normal. And being normal, they may or may not be associated with the symptoms that you are having in back pain. Okay? It varies in severity. I've got some degree of back pain all the time. Uh, I've done lots and lots of stupid things in my life that didn't have anything to do with the barbell. And as a result, I've been injured pretty badly many times, and my back hurts pretty much all the time. All this rip leans on things shit. You know how I lean on things? Because my fucking back hurts all the time. If I get some of the weight off of it, it helps. And so there's a cottage industry been formed about rip leaning on things. He's leaning on things because he's, because he's in pain, and it helps it a little bit to lean on things, all right? Uh, but, you know, depending on who you are, your back pain may uh, or may not be severe enough to uh, warrant any attention at all. Uh, I just ask you to think about something here. Nobody said you weren't going to be in pain, all right? The older we get, more likely you are to have accumulated enough injuries to where things hurt, okay? There aren't any guarantees here. Sometimes things are just going to hurt. They're going to hurt all over. Sometimes they hurt worse than others. And you can either learn to ignore that or you can't, okay? Some people can ignore it better than others. My personal, and I, I'm going to get a bunch of shitty comments about what I'm about to say about fibromyalgia here. I think fibromyalgia, which is not a diagnosis, it's a description of symptoms, is uh, basically attributable to a hyper-awareness of, of pain sensation. I'm good at ignoring it. Other people are not. And if you are constantly focusing on the fact that something hurts, then that, that's not good for your psychological health. Interestingly enough, lifting weights helps you with that because it teaches you that just because something is hurting doesn't mean that you can't deal with it. Lifting weights teaches you that just because your back hurts doesn't mean that your back can't do a heavy deadlift. It can do a heavy deadlift. Pain is, as, pain is as much probably a psychological thing as it is a physiological thing. And depending on how receptive to you are to the input, uh, you know, the pain will affect you at different levels. Uh, kind of like tinnitus, you know. Those of you that have tinnitus, I've got it right now. If I think about it, yeah, it's a little hiss that's always in the background, right? Some people can't stop focusing on that. I don't pay any attention to it. I have it all the time, and it does not affect me because I don't pay any attention to it. Had I, had I been conscious of it and aware of it all the time, uh, hell, you can't. Some people just can't get to sleep at night without some kind of white noise to cover up the tinnitus. I just don't think about it. I just go to sleep. It doesn't bother me at all. But if I stop and think and get real quiet, I can hear it. But it's, it pains the same way. If you dwell on your pain all the time, then it, it's, it's going to be a bigger problem than if you learn that you don't have to think about it all the time. Because for some people, pain is constant. Pain, you always are hurting somewhere. I'm always hurting someplace every day, all day long, whether it's my back, my shoulders, my knees, my feet. Something is always hurting. I haven't been completely pain-free since, uh, oh, since last night after that second martini. <laughs> Alcohol's good for this, okay? You know, I have to, have to be honest with you. Alcohol is way better for pain than naproxen. And in fact, for me, 
uh, I do not respond at all to opiate analgesics. Uh, I've had, you know, when I remember back in 99, 94, when I had my knee operated on, had a motorcycle wreck, had my knee operated on. Now, that was bad. That was real bad. I remember being in a, a convulsion from the pain in the hospital. My parents are down at the foot of the bed, and it was hurting real, real bad, and it kept getting worse and kept getting worse. And I finally just started jaw locked up and couldn't talk and was just shaking in the bed. It hurts the goddamn bed. So all of you, all of you people that say your pain is a nine, when you're standing there talking to me with a straight face, oh, it's a nine. No, it's not. No, it's not a nine. People are real bad at self-reporting pain. But this thing was a full-blown convulsion. And uh, Mama went and got the nurse, and she came in and gave me a shot of IM Ketorolac, rolled me over on my belly and put a cc of Ketorolac in my ass. And in about 45 seconds, everything was pretty much fine. That's some amazing stuff. It's not an opiate, you know. Uh, I was uh, I was when I was uh, forty, I guess. I guess I was forty. And uh, I'm wondering how the fuck you knew it was Toradol. Toradol. Okay. Yeah. I am Toradol. Yeah, I am Toradol. Excellent stuff. For some things, it works. Yeah. It works better than an opiate in some situations like that. It works. It, it's amazing stuff. It really is, but it's hard on your kidneys, so they don't want they don't want to give it to you a lot. I keep some IM Toradol out at the house just for emergency purposes. I've got a little supply of that rat hold out there, but that stuff is uh, that stuff's amazing. But as far as uh, treatment of pain, I guess a lot of doses of alcoholism have probably been the result of chronic pain, don't you? Yeah, I think that's probably likely, you know, because it, it does do wonders for distracting the brain away from chronic pain. Uh, so pain is an interesting is an interesting phenomenon. It's uh, uh, it's not always even severe pain is not always a reason to go to a surgeon. Okay, just try to keep this in mind. I understand. Uh, that uh, when it gets real, real bad and you get desperate, you're going to do anything you need to do. And I'm not telling you to develop a bourbon habit, okay? But just be aware of the fact that it may not get any better once you wake up, okay? Once you come to grips with that, make your decision. Now, if you've got back pain, what are some of the things that you should not probably do? Well, the first thing I would not do anymore is sit-ups. Sit-ups and back extensions, I would not do those anymore. Now, remember, you have degenerative changes in your spine. If you're 40, you have degenerative changes in your spine. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like little pieces of bone growing where they're not supposed to be growing. It, it looks like discs, intervertebral discs that are thinner than they were when you were 20, all right? A nice big fat disc with an intact pulp core is an excellent thing. It's flexible. It wiggles around just fine. But once you get older and the inexorable changes in your discs lead to the core drying up, you've got a fibrous pad between these two bones, that is no longer nearly as flexible. It's no longer as fat. It does not allow for as much motion as it once did. And this means that wiggling your spine around, either in active flexion from the front using the abs, active extension from the posterior using the spinal erectors, is no longer nearly as good an idea as it was when you were young. And as a general rule, I will tell people that once you have your first episode of back pain, 
of debilitating back pain, your ab work and your low back work need to come from those muscles' normal function of stabilizing the spine. In other words, your abs and your back muscles, the core. Did I, was I disgusting enough when I said the muscles of the core need to be trained with a squat and a deadlift because squats and deadlifts use those muscles in their functional capacity to maintain isometric contraction. They are loaded. When you do a 500 pound deadlift, your back muscles and your abs are under a load. Nothing is relaxed in a 500-pound deadlift. Sit-ups and back extensions are not the only way to strengthen the muscles that stabilize the spine. Now think through this with me. If you've got back pain and you have degenerative changes in your spine the way you do if you're 50 years old, I don't care what the chiropractor tells you. Don't do sit-ups anymore. Quit wiggling your spine around. Get your spinal stability work from stabilizing the spine like you do when you squat and deadlift and press, okay? Don't injure your spine by mashing the little pointy bones into the intervertebral discs. Don't aggravate things with motion that does not help anything, okay? So that's my first advice I give somebody that first comes down with that bad bout of back pain. And look, I didn't take this advice myself. And I promise you, you'll hurt yourself. I have produced, the last time I did this, I laid down and did a whole bunch of sit-ups to show a guy how good a sit-ups I, I could do without, uh, without having done any sit-ups in training, that I could still do a set of 10 sit-ups with 35 pounds on my chest. And I did the 10 sit-ups, and I got up off of the bench, and my back was tweaked. Really, that's what I did. And I thought, oh, shit, here's some kind of direct evidence for this. And then, you know what I did? I squatted. Squat at 315 for a set of 10. Back was fine. I mean, it was still tweaked, but it wasn't any worse. In other words, I heard it doing sit-ups. And I didn't hurt it once it was already hurt doing squats. Now, think very carefully about this. I had a belt on, and I was very careful to not wiggle my back around, as I always am when I squat. So... Get out of the, get past the notion that you have to do sit ups and back extensions in order to strengthen your spine. What strengthens the spine more, sit ups or 500 pound deadlifts? What strengthens the abs more, sit ups or 500 pound deadlifts? Okay. No, just, you know, put that aside. Okay. But, also, be aware of the fact that when you tweak your back, you have to train through it. Doing nothing is a bad idea. Very few injuries, and this is, I know, this is horrible to hear. Very few injuries respond to rest. Very few injuries respond to rest. Uh, if you have a fracture, you have a bony fracture, you must not load it to the extent that it keeps moving the fracture plane around because then it can't heal, obviously. But here's something that's not quite as obvious. That injury must be loaded at some level because the osteoblasts on either side of the fracture plane know there's a fracture in between them because of the movement. The movement is the signaling mechanism that tells the osteoblasts to heal the fracture because in the absence of a fracture, there aren't any movement going on between the, these two groups of cells. The movement is the signaling mechanism that causes the cells to heal the bone fracture. And here's how you know this. 
What are the fastest healing bones when fractured in the human body? Anybody want to take a guess? Ribs. Your ribs. Your ribs heal the fastest. Broken ribs take three weeks, right? The broken femur takes quite a bit longer than that, doesn't it? But if you completely immobilize a broken femur, it will not heal. It has to be loaded at some level, okay? Keep this in mind when people are telling you about a rehabbing a fracture. There must be some load to cause some degree of movement across the fracture, fracture plane so that the healing mechanism knows it needs to proceed, okay? Uh, back injuries, however, are not typically fractures. The most common back injuries, back tweaks, are interesting in that their etiology is, I'm not sure I completely understand this, but I do know one thing. I do know that when you go into the doctor, when you, do, when you are so foolish as to hurt your back, tweak your back and go to the doctor about it, and he tells you you've pulled a back muscle, that 99% of the time, he is wrong. You haven't pulled a back muscle. Okay. What muscles pull? Well, those of you that have torn a hamstring know that hamstrings pull. Those of you who have torn a, a uh, quadricep have have had an actual muscle tear in a quadricep. And I mean a tear where there's a bruise. Uh, those of you that have torn a lats, that happens from time to time. Triceps tear. Biceps pull from time to time. All of those muscles have one thing in common. They actively function in concentric and eccentric contraction. They get longer and shorter. What do your back muscles do? They are isometric muscles, and they don't move around. They don't change length a lot. A hamstring tears when it is overpowered eccentrically or concentrically. When you subject it to a dynamic stress that it cannot compensate for, and it tears. It's an actual tear, like a cut on the skin. It's a tear. It bleeds. It's a wound. All right? That's what's always interesting to me. What is the first thing people want to do when they have a, when they have a hamstring tear? They want to massage on it. Right? Well, when you cut your arm, do you massage on that? No, that's obviously, that's obviously kind of a bad idea. Do you, yeah, do you stretch it? Do you stretch it? Do you have a cut on your arm? Do you stretch it apart? Make it nice and wide. No, because that's dumb, right? It's just as dumb to stretch a muscle belly tear. Don't stretch it. It's, it's not hurt because it's not flexible enough. <laughs> it's hurt because it got exceeded in terms of its dynamic loading capacity. You hurt it. You tore it. If you stretch it, guess what you're doing? You're tearing it some more. Don't do that. Resist the temptation to be dumb. Every time you get the opportunity, don't be dumb. All right? Those things need to be iced, and in about three days, they need to be back in contraction. They need to be worked through, just like all other injuries. A torn muscle belly needs to be worked so that when it remodels, it will remodel back to its good old contractile self. A back injury is the same way. Back injuries need to be worked through. I realize when you first have a back tweak, you can't move very well, okay? That lasts about 36 hours, all right? And then after about 36 hours, you need to get your ass back under the bar and do something. Load it. Move it around. Keep it still, but move the back through angle. You don't necessarily, you don't need, I mean, not necessarily, you don't need to extend and flex the back when it's injured, but you do need to subject it to varying amounts of moment load by going through 
the range of motion from the hips with a rigid back. Load it. The muscles that control the area of the injury are then placed in a load and they pump blood through the area and there's just something about lactate that seems to heal things. And that's why we like higher reps for rehabbing an acute injury. You pump a bunch of blood through there, you generate some lactate, presence of the lactate. I don't have the mechanism for this, but it does seem to have some kind of a corrective effect on all types of injuries. So keep that in mind. You have to train it. You have to train through these injuries. Now, if you know that you are predisposed to back injuries, and lots and lots of us are, we get them all the time. Humans all get back injuries, but some of us get them more frequently than others. What do you think the best approach to this is? Is the best approach to repetitive back injuries to just sit down and take it easy? Or is it to get the back stronger? Well, we've just observed that all humans have degenerative changes in the spine. That's a normal part of being a human. It's a normal part of being a biped at the age of 40, 50, 60, 70, right? Do you think it would be better to have a bad back be weak or a bad back be strong? Just let that sink in just a minute. Lots and lots of people that suffer from periodic acute back pain have found that their chronic back pain goes away when they train the squat and the deadlift, when they load the thing correctly, when they keep the intervertebral relationships in good, tight, isometric control, and then lift heavier and heavier weights, thus producing a greater amount of isometric strength with which to hold the spine still. A stronger back is chronically a less painful back. What we typically find is that if you train correctly, your periods of acute back pain are going to go away too, or at least become less frequent. Low back pain is, a, is an interesting thing. It, it, the, the mechanism by which the thing hurts uh, is not terribly well understood. It could be a, a tweak to a ligament in one of the intervertebral processes. could be a tiny little, teeny little muscle belly tear down at the intervertebral level. Certainly not a wholesale strain of the, of the longissimus dorsi, the, the spinal erector muscle belly that doctors seem to think it is. It is a, it's a little isolated injury in between, say, could be an inflamed facet joint. There's all, I don't know, all right? I don't know, and I don't know that anybody else knows either. It could be a combination of all of these factors. But if we're, if we're going to experience back pain, and we are, we're humans, we're going to experience back pain. I promise you that you will experience back pain. Your experience with back pain will be more productive if your back is strong. Now, we've, a strong back, as we've observed, is, is in a better position to hold the intervertebral relationships constant so the injury doesn't take place in, to begin with. But everybody's going to have a tweaked back. And if your back is strong, you are going to be more able and more likely to go ahead and work it and train it and deadlift and squat on it so that it gets better faster than you would if you were not capable of squatting and deadlifting. This is, a, this is an overlooked mechanism of why you want your back strong. We know that backs respond to work when they're hurt. You're more likely to be able to do the work, and you're more likely to be willing to do the work if you have a work history 
with the squat and the deadlift. Now, sometimes back injuries are, are more serious and they need to be addressed, all right? If you hurt your back and it's a, it's a dynamic injury suffered in a car wreck, you, you may have a bad problem. You may have a bad problem. You may have a spondylolisthesis where the, the posterior structures on one vertebra are separated from that vertebral body and the thing can slip forward. This is a potentially very, very bad injury, especially if it occurred in a dynamic loading situation. That injury is often a congenital malformation of the spine. But uh, if you've got a, uh, if you've got a, uh, a spondylolisthesis, as a result of a back injury, that's a bad deal. That's going to need to be addressed. It probably could very well be that it needs to be stabilized. Although I know some lifters with a grade three spondylolisthesis that are deadlifting over 400 pounds. My friend Ellen Stein has got a grade three, and she's a hell of a lifter at the age of 66, and she's uh, she's real strong with a with a grade three spondylolisthesis. In other words. Everything that you can train needs to be trained. Uh, If you've got radiculopathy down a leg, it could be something that's not particularly bad, like sciatica. Sciatica is not really a back pain problem. Uh, Sciatica is typically caused by entrapment of the sciatic nerve uh, in the pelvis by the piriformis, and that can usually be resolved with a vicious deep, horrible, sadistic massage of that area of your glute that exposes itself to your elbow when you mash on the piriformis. Uh, so sciatic is not really an indication. But if you've got loss of bowel control, you're peeing yourself, you know, this sort of thing. You're, you've got numb spots all up and down your legs. A whole leg is numb. A foot is numb. This is a neurological problem with your back, and it's it, it needs to be investigated. But again, as I mentioned much earlier in the show, uh, these are a tiny minority of the back pain situations that we find ourselves in as humans. Uh, I Just this past weekend, I had some experience working with a guy that had Harrington rods in his back. He's one of these guys that had uh, bad scoliosis. It was causing a problem, and uh, they installed... Uh, essentially hardware all the way from his thoracic spine down to his sacrum and, in fact, uh, installed braces across to his ilium. In other words, he doesn't have any back movement anymore. But what we did with him was we put him in the rack and had him do a rack pull and had him load the spine and contract the spine to the extent that he could under a moment load as he came from one angle up to erect we did three sets of five with the empty bar, and he didn't have any problems with that. And my recommendation for him was to go have five pounds of workout and do three sets of five, and let's see how strong we can get him. Uh, his back will respond just like your back will. It'll get stronger if he's loaded carefully and correctly through this range of motion. So, uh, boys and girls, let's just keep a couple of things in mind, all right? If you are uh, fortunate enough to not be dead by the time you're 35 or 40 years old, you're going to have back pain. Sorry, can't do anything about it. It's the truth. Humans, the universal human experience is back pain. All right? There's nothing you can do about that except to reduce the possibility that that back pain will be chronic, persistent, more acute, or result in neurologic problems by getting your back as strong as you can get it. Now, you get your back strong with squats, deadlifts, and presses, not with sit-ups and back extensions because sit-ups and back extensions do not load the spine enough to produce the strength adaptations that the big barbell movements will produce. If you want a strong back, you have to get your deadlift and your squat up. And there's no way around that. And if you decide that you don't like to lift weights, then I suggest that you develop uh, a, 
a good relationship with your drug dealer because you're going to have to treat these symptoms some other way because you will have these symptoms. I hate to be that way about it, but God damn it. You know, laziness is, there's a price for that, especially if your back's bothering you. Uh, thanks for joining us on the uh, podcast today. Starting Strength Radio comes to you every Friday. And uh, if you'd like to hear a topic discussed, uh, please uh, don't phone it in. We don't want to talk to you on the phone. Send it in through our Speak Up link on the website. I'll post a link to this uh, podcast on my Q&A if you'd like to discuss it. Post your thoughts in that thread, and we'll uh, deal with them as they come in. Appreciate your attention. Talk to you